Hi, I'd like to welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Don Patel. I'm the Growth Services Manager for the Georgia Manufacturing Extension Partnership, or Georgia MEP. And I'd like to welcome you to our webinar today, How to Take a Proactive Approach to Marketing Your Machine Shop. This is the fourth in a series of four webinars that we've done on um, helping out machine shops with um, several different areas. and um, these webinars are also being recorded and are located on the Georgia MEP website. So if you missed any of the previous three, uh, feel free to go to the Georgia MEP website and um, look them up there. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, and again, we appreciate your attendance and we hope this is a helpful webinar for you. Next. To give you a little bit of background, the uh, MEP National Network is a unique public-private partnership that delivers comprehensive proven solutions to U.S. manufacturers, fueling growth and advancing U.S. manufacturing. Focused on helping small and medium-sized manufacturers generate business results and thrive in today's technology-driven economy, the MEP National Network comprises the National Institute of Standards and Technologies Manufacturing Extension Partnership, or NIST-MEP. It also includes the 51 MEP centers located in all 50 states in Puerto Rico, and over 1,300 trusted advisors and experts at more than 400 MEP service locations, providing any U.S. manufacturer with access to resources they need to succeed. Next. Last year, the 51 MEP centers worked with approximately 28,000 manufacturers across the nation to create and retain 122,000 jobs, create 16 billion in sales, save 1.7 billion in operating expenses, and invest 4 billion back into their plants for future growth. Next. The Georgia Manufacturing Extension Partnership is the Georgia arm of the national MEP network and is based out of Georgia, the Georgia Institute of Technology. We use a solution-based approach to help Georgia manufacturers grow their business by increasing top-line growth and reducing bottom-line costs. We have 10 offices across the state, and our team members are strategically located to reach any Georgia manufacturer within two hours. Each region has a local region manager who may contact you after the webinar if you're in the state of Georgia for follow-up and to introduce himself or herself. Next. Like many of the MEP centers across the country, we help manufacturers in their process improvement efforts with technology integration, ISO management systems, product quality, energy savings, sustainability efforts, and identifying and developing new business opportunities. Next. I'd like to introduce Katie Takix, who will be doing our webinar today. Katie is the Marketing and Operations Manager for the Georgia Manufacturing Center Partnership at Georgia Tech. Katie oversees the outreach efforts of Georgia MEP and the operational structure supporting Georgia MEP's reporting and administrative functions. With more than 20 years of marketing experience, her areas of expertise include project management, marketing strategies, lead generation through marketing tactics, website development, and technical copywriting. In addition, Katie, Katie recently co-led a team to implement the CRM tool Salesforce into the Georgia MEP organization. Katie holds a Bachelor's of Science in Business Administration and Marketing from the University of Florida and an MBA degree from Nova Southeastern University. So with that, I would like to welcome Katie Takix. Thank you, Katie. Thanks, Don, for that great in introduction. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. So I'm excited to speak with you all today about how to take a proactive approach to marketing your machine shop. So we had over um, 115 people register for this webinar, and, <clears throat> and based on the responses of the 100 manufacturers um, that were signed up, we, we asked for some information during the registration, so we pulled together some interesting statistics. 
So 76% of those people, uh, of those on this webinar have five or less customers that equate to 25% of your business. 87% of the manufacturers on the webinar have one customer that accounts for 10% of your business. Those are really staggering numbers when you think about the totality of your business. The 80-20 rule suggests that 80% of your company sales should come from 20% of your customers. So just think about this for a minute. What would happen if one or two of those top customers of yours went out of business? What if they took their business elsewhere? What if they reduced their orders by half or by a third? Would your business be able to survive? Would you have to have layoffs? Would your staff have to take pay cuts just so you could keep everyone employed? When you have situations where a few customers make up a majority of your business, it's incredibly important to have a proactive plan. So last month, Andy Helm talked about growth strategies and diversification was one of them. So today, we're going to talk about three things. Finding new customers by understanding your customer base. So essentially diversifying your customer base. How to reach these customers and taking your website from a passive tool to a lead generation tool. <coughs> If you don't know your current customers, it makes it very hard to target new ones. So the question I have for you is, do you know who your customers are? And by that, I don't mean what their company names are. Before you can find new customers, you need to truly understand who they are and what motivates them. The benefit you have as a smaller manufacturer is that you don't need to delve into thousands of customers to get this data. What we're talking about is pulling your past customers for the past two to three years and categorizing them into what we call the ABC model. So what does that mean? Well, it's a quick way to categorically define your customers, their attributes, and how loyal they are to your company. So what does an A customer look like to you? Well, these are gonna be your best customers. They're the ones that either order from you a lot, maybe in smaller increments, or have that reoccurring larger order, but the key is that you are their go-to. They are not shopping around. These are the customers that if you lose one or two, it would really hurt your business. So what does that B customer look like? Well, they'll have similar qualities to your A customers, <clears throat> yet you'll find they're not always loyal. If your price point increases a bit, the customer service declines ever so slightly, they would consider jumping ship and going elsewhere. If they did, it would make an impact on your revenue, but it would not break your company. And then we have your C customers. These are the ones that have ordered from you once or maybe twice at most, and did so because of a price point on an item, a sale you were running, maybe the customer service or quality dipped from the supplier they were working with, or they're just that type to go from supplier to supplier, always changing and looking for that next great deal. So now that you understand what the model is, what do you do with it? So one approach is to go after as many of these smaller C customers as possible. Some companies think the more of these C customers you get, the more your revenue will keep increasing. The truth is, is that these customers are the most expensive to acquire, they are not loyal, and the chances are slim that they will change their buying behavior. And because they're constantly cycling out, you will always be searching for more of them. So it becomes a very costly process. So I say that, but they're still your customers, so you still wanna keep them on your good side and, and you wanna please them, but we're not gonna spend a ton of time and energy today trying to convert them up to an A or B level customer or even finding more customers that look like them. So you really wanna focus on those A's and B's. So what should you do? It should be twofold. Your goal should be first to convert B's to A's, and second, find at least another A outside of your current customer base. So once you're defining all these, should you convert all of your Bs to As? Or will they even all convert? Probably not. But by converting a couple of them, you'll get closer aligned to that 80-20 rule we talked about on that first slide. So after you define what would make up your, um, so in order to create that A and B ABC model, it, it breaks down into five steps. The first is you want to define what makes up your A, B, and C customers for your business. And then you're going to create a list of attributes and purchasing behaviors that are important to you. 
So on both of those, what I want to stress is that each of your criteria will be different based on your own unique business. So one person on this phone call will be very different than the next person. Then, you'll go, then you're going to want to take your customers from the past two to three years and start categorizing them as, um, or I'm sorry, you're going to take your customers from the past two or three years and list them out. Then you're going to start filling in the data across your spreadsheet, and then you're going to mark them into your A, B, and C categories. So I've taken this and created an example for a fake company that I created. And after the end of the, this presentation, I'll be sending out this spreadsheet so you all will have a, an ABC model to start working with. So this is kind of what it looks like. So for the purpose of this, we're going to start down here at the bottom. You'll see that I have three definite, I've defined my A, B, and C customers, and that's what I did first. So my definition of an A customer is a repeat customer. They have higher than average margins, and they're located in the southeast. And again, I, ma I made this company up completely. Um, you might have, when you do it, a very specific profit margin that you say anybody who orders over this profit margin would be considered an A customer. Uh, B customer, I didn't fill out. Again, I didn't fill out this whole spreadsheet, but I just kind of filled out a majority of it. The C customer for me would be a one-time customer. They have a very small profit margin, and they're located outside of the, of the Southeast and maybe not in one of the main industries we serve. So those are kind of how I've defined what my A, B, and C customers look like. Then I've come up here in column A and I've put all my customer names in, clients 1 through 15. We're going to come back to column B in a second, and we're really going to skip, we're really going to focus on column C through L and skip column J for right now. So for the purpose of this example, I listed out all of my attributes in column C through L. What was important to me as I was thinking about who my customers were, <coughs> um, were the number of orders they had per year, what their total spend was last year, what the cost of the products they bought and what my net gain was. Did they have any exact orders that they repeated on their purchases? What types of products did they order? What was their location? And we're going to skip this column. What was their industry and how did we acquire their business? I then went and once I defined what those attributes were that were important to me, I went in and started filling out all of the information. So I filled out how many orders they had per year. I filled out the total that they spent and the cost. And I filled out everything that was pertinent. Then I came back and based on my criteria here at the bottom, the A, B, and Cs, I started filling out um, what level, I started filling out customer, column B and what level these clients each were to me, whether they were at A, a B, or a C level. Then after I was done, I said, I need to have a conversation with my A's and B's. At this point, again, we're not focusing on the C's, but I wanted to understand my A's and B's, and I wanted to know why they were purchasing from us and not somebody else. The biggest thing is to go have these conversations with them. Don't be afraid to call them. They're going to talk to you, but you have to set that stage ahead of time. If you sent them an email and say, you know, I'd like to spend a few minutes just to understand, you know, um, why you why you purchased from us or why you've chosen to do all this business with us in the past couple of years, just so you can better understand that scope, lay it out for them. Tell them you only want a five minute phone call. They will absolutely talk to you. But if you just kind of send them an email, say, hey, do you have some time to talk about how we're doing and all that? They might be afraid it's going to be a two hour phone call. So set that stage kind of up front. The biggest thing with a spreadsheet like this is you don't have to collect everything. You just really want to collect the most important things that are going to paint you a picture of who your customer is or of who your customers are. The more strategic you are about collecting the information, the clearer the picture it's going to paint for you. It sounds super elementary, but what will start happening is um, you'll start seeing patterns, which I've highlighted in the spreadsheet. And we'll talk, we'll point out a little bit on the next slide. So this is this is everything that I highlighted over here on this next slide. I took out everything that I was not looking for patterns in, and I took out all of my C customers, because again, we weren't focusing on them. So here's some trends that I started seeing within this information. I started noticing that my top customer locations were in Georgia and the Southeast. I started no noticing that I was getting referral, that a lot of my top customers came from 
referrals from suppliers. I also started noticing that half of my top customers bought widget A and lever B together, but half of them only bought widget A. So this brought up some questions in my mind. And as we get further into the presentation, I'll start mentioning how I've incorporated some of my findings from my fictional company into the next steps. So now that you understand more about your customer, it's time to reach them. The first thing you'll want to do is develop a plan. I want to point out, and I know this is a marketing call, but I want to point out that I'm calling this a plan. When I first started developing this presentation, I did put marketing plan on it, but 79% of you don't have a dedicated marketing person. So I wanted to be clear that this is a plan of action to grow your business that any of you will be able to develop and maintain. And I also wanted you all to understand that you that you weren't just alone in that 79%. Sometimes you think that you're alone and not having that marketing person. A lot of you don't. So we wanted to make something that was easy and, and functional for you guys to each implement. So it's gonna be in three parts when we develop that plan. We're gonna start with what are our goals? Well, we already talked about that at the beginning. The three goals that, we, that we've talked about for our fictional company and the purpose of this webinar is we wanna change the breakdown of our current customer base to the 80-20 rule. We wanna convert two of our B customers into A customers. Now, for the purpose of the fictional company, I just came up with two. Uh, it might be that you have five, it might be that you only have one. Uh, th that number will just vary by each of us. And we wanna find one additional A customer outside of the current customer base. Again, if you find two, that's awesome. But you know finding one A is always a great thing. So this is just kind of a, you'll see the bigger picture plan kind of come together, but this is what the first column in it looks like. And this is the goals that we just discussed. Um, as a next part, it becomes now that you've established the goals, how do you meet them? How are you going to achieve them? Well, under each of these, you'll list why you should be doing it, why, why you should be doing something. So for example, the three ways that we're gonna meet the goals that we just established is by profiling our current customer base. And again, for the purpose of this webinar, we did that first. Um, this, but the second part was to generate loyalty within our customers. And the third part was to communicate our company story and our value proposition. So under each of these, I'm gonna list why I'm gonna be doing this, and you'll see that in the next slide. The biggest thing I can point out to you is if you can't answer why you should be doing something, and if one of these is not aligned with, your, with the, one of the goals you just created, don't do it. As business owners or those working at small manufacturing companies, you have plenty on your plate. Do not create work for yourself. Uh, be clear in what you want to achieve, be targeted and be intentional and you'll figure and you'll find out fast that by being focused, it will allow you to attain these goals faster. So again, you'll see on the left, these are the goals that we brought up <coughs> two slides ago. And on the right, in green, these are the these are the categories of how we're going to meet the goals that we talked about. And in black, these are the benefits that distinguish the two. So we're gonna profile our current customer base so that we can create a better understanding of who they are and allow us to target customers. We're gonna generate loyalty because it will increase orders and profit. It will make us more market resilient. It will reconnect us with our customers, et cetera, et cetera. So those will all be specific to what your company is looking to do. So now here's what I like to call the fun part. Once you have your goals and how you're gonna meet them, it's actually putting the plan into, pl into place. So the interesting part with marketing is every time you turn around, there's a new thing that you can test, a new what I like to call shiny ball or program to try out. But with companies your size and what you are working to achieve here, there's one really important thing to keep in mind, keeping it simple. So remember, 79% of you don't have a marketing person. In addition, 49% of you, that's just less than half, don't have a salesperson either. So if you create a plan that's too complicated or too technical, it's going to sit on a shelf. And this time next year, you'll be in the same predicament where too few, where too few of your customers make up a majority of your business. And at that point, we may be in a different economy. So you don't wanna put yourself in that position. So a couple other tips on this don't have too many action items. Again, we kind of already touched on that. If, if you have too many, nobody's gonna do them. 
don't try to start them all at the same time. We've all created a plan where everyone's super gung ho about it and they all want to start it on September 1st. But you have to keep your business moving. So by trying to start a bunch of new initiatives at the same time while you're trying to keep your business moving doesn't do you any favors. And you have a team of people. They might be small. You, you know, you have other people in your organization. You might be in a five person um, company but there are other people there that can take on some of the responsibilities. Don't try to shoulder all this yourself. So based on the goals in our fictional company and how we're gonna meet the goals, these are some of the ideas I pulled together based off the data I collected. So again, I want you to see how it's kind of all, um, kind of all pulled itself together. So if you remember, Based on my examples, a majority of my customers were in Georgia or within the Southeast. So under generating loyalty with, with my customers, I thought one of the good things could be to invite my A and B customers within a very small radius to a showcase to see new products. And by having a showcase at my facility, they could come in and not only see that they could not only hear about the products, but they could touch them and feel them and, and look at other opportunities. And, and sometimes that brings up other types of conversations. Uh, this is number three under part B. Um, so I thought that would be a great way to do that. Um, as part of this, I created a loyalty rewards program. And again, these are just examples based on the data I collected. And I wanted to move some of these B customers up to A customers. And I felt by creating a loyalty rewards program and communicating out to the B customers only that I would get some traction. And then I would track who would redeem this. So if it doesn't work, I wouldn't do it again in the future. But if it does work, why did it work? And how do we kind of, how do we grow that program? Um, number two under B, was what I noticed on my on my data before was I, I mentioned that half of the companies bought widget A and lever B, but only half bought widget A. So my thought was, could there be an opportunity for an upsell? Could I create a package for items that are purchased together more than 50% of the time to incentivize those that are not purchasing that second item to do so? And by doing that, communicate the benefit of the secondary item. So they don't just feel like we're upselling them for no reason but mainly talking about if customers who have bought A and also bought B and what it's done for their business and, and really promoting it that way to the customer. Um, <clears throat> under number three, or part C, I'm sorry, um, we talked about many of my A and B customers came from supplier referrals. So what could I put in place to get more customers from them? So it was, it was just a simple message on here of working with the suppliers directly that have sent us a majority of our AB leads to offer incentives to send more. So this is just quick ways I've taken some of the snapshots of data that I, uh, of data intelligence that I gained just by looking at who my customers are and what their behaviors are and turns it into a plan for growth. So now that you've seen how we've kind of taken that and mapped out a plan, we're gonna go back to some of the basics when it comes to marketing. So with any company, it's important to communicate who you are, what you are doing, and what makes you different. And that's called your unique selling proposition. And you can see under here, under the communicate the story, developing that unique selling proposition and aligning it with the website. So if you don't have a USP or unique selling proposition, or you need to update yours, here's a really quick way to go about it. Ask. If you just assume, you are not gonna get the right answer. It's okay to find positives, but also you wanna discover the negatives. By doing so, you are not gonna create a false message. You never wanna advertise something you don't do. <coughs> For example, we have the best product options and you go out and you advertise that, only to discover that your customers come to you when they need the basic colors of something, but go to your competitor when they need the more unique colors. So you have to be really careful in how you position things. So ask your customers, that goes back to the A and B, the ABC model when you're, when you're having conversations with your A and B customers. Ask, ask your staff, understand why your customers could go elsewhere and why they do at times. So when I create a unique selling proposition, I'm looking at three questions. I'm looking at why would they use us? Why would they not use us? 
and what's their alternative. So you'll see at the top, my, my fake company name for the purpose of all this is called the Valve Company. Um, what you're gonna get as you talk to these people is a lot of different answers, and you'll see all that in my additional notes column. So why would they use us? Well, we offer great customer service, quick shipping, quality, we care, fast turnaround of standard products, speed to get catalog orders out the door, on-time delivery, but why wouldn't they use us? Here's a bunch of uh, reasons they wouldn't use us. And what's their alternative? They could go to another manufacturer, they could produce their product, that product in-house. So again, I got a lot of information out there, and that, that's a lot of noise, but what does it mean? So you take all this information, I took um, eight different or seven different bullet points and I wrapped it up into two categories. Customer service was a priority and speed to turn around standard products was a was um, one of, those are the two reasons why customers would use us. After talking to four different people and getting this information about why they wouldn't use us, I rolled it all up into custom parts take longer than expected. So for the purpose of this example, the Valve company, I've now talked to their team and their customers and Again, the two items that came up high were their customer service and speed to turn around orders on standard products. So the unique selling proposition I came up with was when you need standard valves and hose, when you need standard valves and hoses, the valve company team will have your product to you the next day guaranteed. Notice I didn't say when you need valves and hoses, we'll have your product to you the next day. That would have indicated it was for all products. But I knew specifically that only our standard products were able to get out the door fast. So I made it very unique to what we do and what we're best at. So once you have that unique selling proposition, you have to make sure to use it. You have to ensure that your team members understand it and can communicate it. You need to be able to incorporate it into your marketing materials. You need to include it on your website. This is going to be the first place people are looking to understand more of who you are and what you do. <coughs> so we're gonna kind of do a quick math lesson here. We all know there's 24 hours in a day. Most people get six to eight hours of sleep. The average commute time is an hour each day. They spend at least eight hours a day at work. So now we're at 17 hours of the day. You start factoring in things like eating, working out, relaxation, running kids to practice. That doesn't leave much time in the day for anything else. So with their free time and their time at work, yes, even their time at work, people are online. So on average, people spend six hours and 42 minutes online every day. That is one quarter of their day. So it's extremely important that you not only have an online presence, but you have a website that keeps the end user or customer in mind. And the fact is that not only has buying behavior changed and people are buying a lot of their products online, but, but so is the way that people find their information and their sphere of influence and who they trust. So just e-commerce sales alone in the second quarter of 2019 was at $146 billion. And 87% of the shoppers begin searching for products online. So it's really, it's really important <coughs> to incorporate your value proposition on your website. Otherwise, what's gonna happen is you're gonna have a high bounce rate. So for those of you that don't know what that means, it means that people might be able to find you. It means that they're gonna get your website real fast but they're gonna leave your website after only one page, on one page, meaning they're not gonna dig in deeper and see what you're all about. So you wanna give them that reason to stay, and that's really important. So there's some, Forbes had a great article recently with some more stats that I just wanna go to through. Real high level. Um, online reviews impact almost 70% of purchasing decisions. 84% of people trust online reviews as much as personal recommendations. So think about that one for a second. 84% of the people are trusting what people say about products and services online versus them calling a friend and saying, hey, what do you think about X, Y, and Z? 65% of people see online searches as the most trusted source of information about people and companies. 93% of them, when you, when you search on Google, 
93% of the searches never go past that first page. They only look at the top 10 and, and gather their impressions and make their decisions at that point. <coughs> so if you don't have a website, and a few of you indicated that you do not, or if you need to improve your website, which 100% of you on this call who had a website said that you needed to do, we're gonna go over some tips, which I've broken down into three categories. Usability, visual appeal, and content. The point of this is that isn't that you have to go into your website and do all these things right away. But use what I've put down as a guide or a checklist. Go through your site, see how it matches up to what we've talked about, and like anything else you do, prioritize based on what is important to you to update in the near future, based on time and resources. If you use an external agency or an individual who built out your built out and updates your website, talk it through with them and gain their input on what could be improved first based on your initial thoughts. So the first side, the first part is about usability. You have to make it usable. This is the technical side, meaning it doesn't matter how good your content is, these items need to be accounted for when designing or updating your site. Most people stick around a website less than 15 seconds. That's how long you have to capture someone's attention on your site. So if you don't do that in less than a quarter of a minute, you've lost them. So just some tips on, or on usability. Load them fast. Websites should load in two to five seconds. Each sec second beyond two seconds results in greater bounce rates, which we talked about earlier. You wanna think like a customer. <clears throat> Are you asking them to go to multiple pages to check out products that have a similar functionality? Could you categorize them and make them easier to find? If you have a website with an e-commerce part, is it easy to use? Does it require too many steps or have them needing to fill out information, in, the same information in multiple places? Kind of going back to that example we created, if you do have an e-commerce piece, sometime someone could put item A, widget A in your cart, could you create it so that you have, that you, it then suggests to buy lever B and why, why you should buy that and kind of see if you can upsell on that e-commerce side. <coughs> Does your navigation make sense? So ask people not in your company to test your website and give them your feedback. You can ask customers, ask family. If you, if you have teenagers around the house, they are brutally honest. They will tell you what is working and what's not. Dead ends, what does that mean? It means don't take your consumers to a page and not have a way to get them back to other important parts of your website. In 2018, 52% of all website traffic worldwide was generated through mobile phones. Your website needs to be able to adapt to mobile devices. There are platforms available out there that can help you do this. So in preparation for this webinar, I picked about a half dozen machine shops to look at, and, and nobody on this webinar, it was just half dozen random machine shops to look at, um, to see what their websites were, were showing. And here's a few things I found when it came to usability. Some had products to sell and they had a shopping cart. So you know the Amazon model, you, you hit purchase, it goes into your shopping cart and you, and you check out, right? So they had the product, they had the shopping cart, but there was no way to, for them to, for any user to add the item to your shopping cart. So I don't know how anybody bought anything on these sites. Their top links were broken. They didn't go anywhere. You couldn't click on them. Um, it showed a link and you clicked and nothing happened. Or it took you to a page that didn't exist or it took you to the wrong place. They had writing over images that were very, very hard to read. So these are just a few things that I saw on six websites I perused. I wanna show you what our website looks like. The left is how it shows on a desktop and the right is how it condenses down for a mobile um, device. But it's, on the right, it shows, it looks a little different, it squishes it in, but it still shows all of the pertinent information, the navigation still remains the same. So that's how you kind of, when you when you switch over, that's kind of a, a way it should look like. It should size it based on what your what kind of screen that you're looking at. Um, wanted to show you some examples from some good machine shops I did find um, in browsing. Um, on the right, you can see this company did have writing over their image, 
but it was easy to read. And when you rolled over it, the image background actually darkened up so the copy was made even brighter. <laughs> On the bottom, the co this company with balancing consumer XRF testing, all that, they had nine services they were offering on a page on their website, and they had a paragraph and an image along with each service. That can get really long, and when you scroll, you, you don't know when to stop, and it just kind of seems to be too much. So what they did was they added these neat little buttons at the top of the page, and when a customer is interested in la laser etching, even though it was the sixth one down, it, it jumped down to where that information was available on the page. So just really quick ways to do things to make it more simple. This top one, this top left one, had easy, clear navigation. You didn't have to guess and wonder what this company did. So those are a few different examples of usability. So going back to keeping it simple, your design should not be too complex. This is about visual appeal, how something looks. <coughs> You want to keep it simple. You don't want to have really bright colors as the main colors that would turn people off. You want to have real images. You don't want to use stock photography. You want people to be able to see themselves within their within the images that you're displaying. So if if you are taking pic, if you're using product pictures, take photos of your products, either whether they're finished or in use. Consistency. <laughs> if you're if you're going to bold headers, bold them everywhere. If you're going to use italics on captions, do the same everywhere. So again, in the same research I did for this webinar, here's three things within the six websites. I mean, I, I found things left and right, but just things I wanted to point out. Images on their, one, of, one company had images on their homepage of six different screws. And to be honest with you, to the untrained eye, every single screw looked completely the same. They, they were a little different, but for somebody who doesn't know anything about them, you really can't, couldn't tell the difference. So I was thinking, when, when you rolled over, when you put your mouse over it and hovered, the images got a little bit bigger. Like, oh wow, if I click on this, it's gonna give me more information about the product. So I took the bait, I clicked on it. All it did was give me a larger image of the same photo. It gave me no information. Nothing, just a larger image of the same photo. I saw plenty of sites that had paragraphs indented in some places and not in others. I saw plenty of sites that had font sizes that were different and the sizes were off. I had, I, I saw a few websites over the course of these six sites I looked where you know there's an image that should have been there, but instead of saying, instead of having an image, it actually said image coming soon. These are all things that I can, going back to, people spend no more than 15% or 15 seconds on a website to decide if they want to stay. If that stuff is happening on your website, I guarantee you people are not going to want to stay on your site. They're not going to want to dig further and seeing what you can do. This, this is your, this is like a resume. This is like your, your first big bang and, and you need to kind of make it so that people are really excited about who you are and what you do. So I wanted to show you some great examples that I did find for, um, for visual appeal. You don't have to include all these, but see if there are other ways to get your point across without just text. So text, and we're gonna talk about this on content. If you have a website with just text, it gets boring. And truthfully, people just don't read it that much. They might skim it, but they're not gonna read it. So is there a way to get your point across without just using text? So to the right, under quick links, you'll see they use icons. So that's always a great way to get a message across. The one on the bottom used infographics. This one is infographics about manufacturing, but it could be about anything in your business. The one on the top left said, see us in action. And they're giving, they have a couple of videos that are posted. So these are all great ways to tout who you are and what you do without just talking about who you are and what you do in, you know, paragraph upon paragraph of text. Couple three, uh, three more examples I saw. These are great 
images that represent their audiences. So again, make sure you know who your audience is and represent them and make sure you're representing them or what they're interested in in the images that you're displaying on your website. So from a content purpose, and this is the, the third category, communicate your unique selling proposition. That's really important. That needs to be on your website. You just spent all this time creating it. Make sure it's there and make sure it's front and center. Keeping your content simple. Don't if you're if you're going to not if you're going to use words in an area and not icons or infographics or something, don't say something in 500 words that you can say in 100. So don't get super wordy. Use words that people understand. Don't get too technical. So a lot of websites, especially machine shops, put a product out there and slap this spec sheet next to it. People are not going to read that. Highlight a couple of key features for the item and then move on to the benefit and how they can use the product. So again, going back to that example of widget A and lever B, let's say you don't have a shopping cart, but you know the two items pair well together. And you're you're displaying image or widget A on your website in one area, but lever B is on a totally different area. You can have that second item link off of the first item, or you can talk about the benefits of the two items together and have them connect on your site. Include words in your text that people are searching Google on. That's really important. You want to come up on those first in that first page, make sure that you're that you're putting words in there that people are looking for. Do you have call to actions on your website? What do you want them to do? Do you want them to call you? Do you want them to download a tip sheet? Do you want to have them inquire about more product information, just be really clear. Make sure you're including your team's photos. It lets people know who they're dealing with and lets them know they're dealing with real people. Bios are also great to include as long as they're short. Again, nobody wants to read two pages of a bio. Customer testimonials are another big key factor. Don't forget that 84% of people trust online reviews as much as personal rep, as much as a personal recommendation. So make sure that you're including those customer testimonials. So <clears throat> on those websites I, I went through, I um, found a couple interesting things about content. I, I found one that said newsletter on the top of the navigation, like all the way at the top, it had like a place to click for the newsletter. But if you clicked on it, it did take you to a page and all it had was a big picture. So that page not only, I, and I was expecting when you click on it, it would give you all this information about the newsletter. So all it gave me was a picture. It didn't give me any examples of the newsletter and it didn't give me a place to sign up for the newsletter. So why even have it? Maybe it's not ready. Maybe they're thinking about doing that down the road. But if so, don't include it at that point. I saw photos that were not consistently taken. I, I'm not joking. Some of these photos looked like they were taken inside of somebody's kitchen. Um, they, some looked like they were taken outside. They just were, it just didn't look professional. It didn't look clean. Um, I do want to show you some good examples of what I found. Um, so this top one, they incorporated their unique selling proposition in a prominent way. In one quick glance, you know exactly who they are, what they do, and why they're different. Uh, down here, they had these two call to actions at the top of every page. So at every page, you could click on it for them to call, uh, for to call them, to call them, or to request a quote. They're two different calls to action, but it's the same thing. You're getting them to reach out to you. They're just saying it in a different way. Maybe call us doesn't resonate with one, but request a quote resonates with another customer. And by putting them next to each other in two different ways, um, <coughs> there's a pretty good chance that somebody's gonna click them. Now, same company at the bottom of every page, every single page on their website, they had this big bar at the bottom. So not only did they say call us at the top, but they had a longer call to action asking them to call in a different way. So you have a question, oh, we can help you, talk to us. Basically saying, give us a call. And then once we get you on the phone, we're gonna be able to sell our product to you. They're just saying it in a different way. So 
So these two, um, this is a customer testimonial. This is a great way to do it. They had rolling testimonials. So it was only one on a screen at the same time, but it was, they had about 10 testimonials kind of lined up and they were just floating through. And, and they had it so in a speed that it wasn't too slow and it wasn't too fast. So you could read all the testimonials before it moved on to the next, you could read a testimonial before it moved on to the next one. And the one on the bottom, <coughs> before they ask you to request a quote, they're telling you that you're ex gonna experience something different by talking to them. So again, it's just different ways to ask the same things, but it's, it's all about getting somebody's attention. So with all those websites, going again, going through everyone's, um, everyone's sites that I did see, and knowing that there's plenty of people on this call that need some quick improvements to their website, Go back through, use these as a, as a checklist. You know, the first things I would recommend, make sure you have your images where they need to be. Make sure you don't have any broken links. Make sure they go, the links go to the right places. Make sure you're consistent in your fonts and your headers and all of that. Just clean up the basics of it. Those are some really quick fixes that you can make. And then long-term, you'll be able to start making, you know, some larger strategic changes to your site and really cleaning up the content and the visual appeal of it. So we've covered a lot of information today, but here's the top couple things if I can leave you with. Um, understanding who your customers really are. Be intentional, intentional about how you wanna grow. Be targeted when proactively looking for growth. Keeping it simple, again, that's my main thing. Don't try to start everything at the same time. You don't need to do everything, but you do need to prioritize what you wanna do based on those needs. Um, as a reminder, I'll be sending out the ABC models as well as I'll be sending out a shell of that marketing plan or planning process that I created um, and a unique selling proposition document. The marketing plan and unique selling proposition document will all be in the same email or will all be in the same Excel file, uh, but I'll include those in the follow-up emails along with a link to the video of this webinar and the slides. Uh, thank you for your time today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Katie. That was an awesome presentation. Um, very, very, very helpful. Um, we have about 10 minutes or so for questions. If you would, um, you could use, if you could use the question feature on the um, GoToWebinar app, I'll be able to see your questions and we can answer them. Also, um, we had a couple questions during the presentation. And um, basically, it was the same question. And, and Katie, the question was um, if we could put a link to the previous three webinars in that email so they can find those if they would like to listen to them. Sure, we can definitely do that. Um, okay. And on the Georgia MEP website, there is a page on there that will have all three uh, videos. They're all YouTube videos or videos that have been uploaded to YouTube. Great. We'll give it just another minute or two for questions. Katie did such a great job. There, I guess there's not many questions. <laughs> well, when I go and send the follow-up email out, if anybody has any questions, feel free to just uh, email me directly. And if you are, I'll just make a mention of this. If you are in Georgia, we... we um, maybe contacting you just to give you some more information on the Georgia MEP and um, the machine shop assessments that we have received a grant for. So um, if you're in Georgia, you might hear a little bit more from us. And also within the other states, your, your local MEP may be contacting you also for follow-up. Um, Don, I did see a question come in. There's a um... All mics are muted, so there's a questions area. Um, if you have a question, you can go ahead and type it in and Don will see it. Um, any advice on SEO? Um, so there's Google has a lot of great, um, great uh, free information out there. I can certainly include some links in my follow-up email about um, SEO. 
Uh, the interesting part about that is it changes constantly. So it's just kind of staying up on top of it. But understanding your keywords, incorporating them into your, um, into your content on your website is very important. So there's tools out there to see what uh, people are searching for and then other terms out there that people that are very similar to maybe what you like, for example, if I were to put in there process improvement, I could come up with that people are also searching for continuous improvement and lean and things like that, whereas I can make sure to incorporate those couple keywords into my site at various pages and make sure they're key, keyword rich. And then you also want to make sure within your title tags and your um, uh, and your pages and your page names that some of those keywords are included in there um, as well. But I can certainly include some links out there for SEO. Katie, I had a question since there's no other ones on the thing. How often on the ABC um, technique would you recommend doing that? Um, I mean, to get started, go ahead. Once you start it, I would do that first one, develop your plan. And the biggest thing is to measure against that plan and maybe revisit it that next year and see how those A, B, and Cs have changed. Like, have you shifted how, you know, you can even revisit it every six months or so to say, okay, what have I done <coughs> to move some of those Bs to As? How many have them moved? You might be able to pinpoint one or two things that have helped push them to the As. Then um, you could say, well, what exactly, which actual tactic help me get a new A, but I would say you'd probably want to look at it, you know, quarterly, every six months or so, but maybe not revise it until a year into it. That way you you don't want to change too many things at once. You want to know what's working and what's not. Great. Sounds like the main point, though, is to have a plan. Yeah, for sure. Okay, we have a question. What are some resources to find potential customers? Um, so I guess that depends on the industry that, um, that you're in when it comes to machine shops, like, are you targeting a specific industry? There might be some, um, data that you can look at from, you know, there's some online databases, uh, maybe through local chambers, economic development groups, um, depending on the type of, if you're, if you're getting specific for an industry, you know, there might be some trade shows out there that are, um, that are industry focused. Um, you know, you could use, there's, there's some different things out there, whether it's um, kind of getting involved in some of the LinkedIn groups that are out there for a specific industry. Uh, depends on how you want to approach it. But there's always lists that you can rent. I don't always recommend those. You got to make sure that they're super clean. Um, but spending a lot of money on mailing lists and email lists that are not clean are not usually the right tactic to approach it, approach something like that. Um, you know, I would I would really kind of see where your customers are currently coming from and seeing before I can best answer that question. But those are just some of the few things out there. Okay, we've had a couple more questions come in. How do we actively reach new customers when emails, phone calls, mailings, and all other attempts are filtered to the proverbial trash can or spam folder? Yeah, so that, uh, yeah. <laughs> so that kind of gets back to um, emails, email lists that you can purchase are very, um, a lot of times they're not good. They're not clean. They're not, um, you can you can get hit with um, canned spam laws and you can actually get your email shut down if you're not doing it correctly. Um, so that's, that's a big deal. Um, you know, again, I would kind of take a look at how you are, who your current customers are and getting in touch and, and how they found out about you. And I think that will help you narrow down some of that. But you could also do things like, you know, those are all, what you're talking about is all um, really active marketing. There's some other things that you could do, put out there, like, depending on who you're, what you're trying to achieve. It could be some paid search marketing. It could be some, on Google, it could be some targeted ads on um, LinkedIn, where if you're with a specific market segment, like, let's say you're with aeros with, with um, looking at aerospace suppliers, and that's who you're targeting, you could build um, 
paid search ads on LinkedIn and target, you know, people who have specific job titles in a specific industry. And then those ads will show up when those people are on LinkedIn. So you could do some very targeted uh, efforts like that. You could also go to some of the industry um, publications and see what kind of opportunities that they have for for sponsorships. Um, so those are all like little little different ideas if you have um, a very specific focus. Um, you could also work with your local chambers or um, your suppliers and see if you can extend your outreach through that through those channels. Great answer. And our last question, Katie, is, um, and you've sort of touched on it, is how about social media, using social media for marketing results? I think social media is great when you have a very specific intentional purpose on why you're doing it and what you're looking to achieve. And each of them should be done in a very different way. So Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, all of those. So again, those could all be shiny tools. My guess is each of you guys don't need all of them. So what one could you start with that would make the most difference? Um, when we started our social media about seven years ago, I got numerous different ideas from the team about which ones they thought should be we should start with. And when it came down to it, what we were looking to achieve was really connecting to the manufacturers and having conversations with them about topics that would interest them. So we started a LinkedIn um, company page and invited our clients to it. And through that, we've gained a lot of traction. And by doing that, we've been able to have some real conversations with the manufacturers that we that we communicate with through that segment and also been able to find new um, customers through that. We didn't start Twitter until like five years later when we had a very specific reason to do so because we launched a PR campaign that was talking about manufacturing and jobs in the state and we were high we were highlighting people in manufacturing in Georgia and we were posting their stories on Twitter Twitter and linking them to our congressional districts in the media. Um, but before that we had no need for Twitter. So I think it's great but you have to be really intentional about what you're trying to achieve. Great. I think that's great advice. Well, I'd like to, again, thank Katie for taking the time to um, give us some great information on marketing, um, machine shops, and small manufacturers in general. And again, I'd like to thank everybody for your attention. And as we had mentioned, we will be sending this out in an email with links to the webinar and um, a copy of the presentation and tools that Katie mentioned and covered. And we'd like to, again, thank everybody for participating and um, contact us at the Georgia MEP or your local MEP um, where you're located for further assistance. And um, thank you and have a great day. Thank you.